Uh, welcome back to our lecture series. Uh, today we're going to be talking about centroid decomposition. Um, so there's a bit of background for this topic, but it, you don't really have to sort of know how it works. Um, so the one sort of important thing we're going to be using is uh, lowest common ancestor, um, which is basically you take two nodes in a tree um, and you find the basically the deepest node that's an ancestor of both of them. Um, so there's an algorithm where you can do this in log n time, uh, which is the nice one that we usually use. There's also a constant time way to do it. Um, we're not going to go over exactly how to do this, uh, but if you guys are interested, we have we had a lecture last semester on it. You can check that out on our YouTube channel. Um, so yeah, so we're basically just going to use LCA as a black box for the purposes of this lecture. Um, and the main thing we're going to use it for is uh, to compute distances between two nodes. Because once you have, uh, once you can compute the LCA, um, if you compute the depths of all the vertices in the tree, uh, you can get distance between any two arbitrary vertices by um, taking this distance from A to the LCA. So depth A minus depth LCA plus depth B minus depth LCA, um, which gives you this formula. So you can compute the distance in O1 once you have the LCA. All right, so other than that, um, there's not really much background for this, um, but it is going to uh, sort of build on itself a lot over the course of the lecture. So if you guys have any questions about this, uh, definitely ask, like even more so than most other lectures because it is gonna really build on itself a lot. Okay, so I guess we can get started. So uh, the first thing is the centroid of a tree. So uh, a centroid of a tree is a vertex where if you remove it, um, the connected components that are left are all of size at most n over two, where n is your number of yeah, vertices in the tree. So like if you look at this green vertex in this tree here, um, if you take this out of the tree, um, your components become size one, size one, size one, and size four. And n in this case is eight because you have eight vertices here. Um, so that this is okay as a centroid because this is no bigger than n over two. And it's kind of a nitpicky thing, um, but here we're using n over two as like float division. Um, so it has to be like strictly more than half. So like if it's an even number, well that if it's an even number it just works out like here with like four and eight. But if it's an odd number, um, you can have a, si a component of size up to uh, like floor n over two. So like if this was seven, we could have a component of size three. Uh, that's, that's kind of a nitpicky thing. It doesn't really matter too much. Um, and the other thing to notice is that a tree can have multiple centroids like this one does. Because if you remove this one, you get components of size one, two, and four, which is also okay. Um, but in general, we're not gonna have more than two. Uh, which we're not going to prove. It, it doesn't, not really super important to what we're going to do here. But the, the important thing is you're always going to have one. Um, any questions so far? All right. So now we're going to talk about how to find it. And this also sort of works as a proof of why a centroid always exists. Um, so what we can do is root the tree arbitrarily, and we're then going to compute all of the subtree sizes, which you can do with the DFS, right? So like we label this one with a nine because there's nine vertices in this subtree, there's two vertices in this subtree, et cetera. You just sort of go down the tree. Um, so once we have all these sizes computed, what we can do is you start at the root, and then you look at the sizes of all of its child subtrees. So if um, none of these sizes are bigger than n over two, then you can stop. Otherwise, um, oh, whoops. Otherwise, notice that at most one child can have a subtree that's bigger than n over two, right? Because otherwise you'd have a total of more than n nodes. Um, so like in this case, uh, n is 17, and this vertex here has a size uh, greater than 17 over two. 
But notice that we can't have more than one of those because otherwise you have more than n nodes. Um, so if you have one of these children that's uh, like, I guess, big, you recurse down to the big child and you repeat. So now we're on 12, we look at these sizes here. Nine is still bigger than 17 over two. So we recurse down to the nine. Um, but then when we look at these sizes, these are all less than 17 over two. So now we stop here and we mark nine as our centroid. And it turns out this is actually the centroid of the tree. So you're basically just doing like a DFS down one chain of the tree to find, to find the centroid. And a uh, quick proof of why this works. So one thing is the process always has to terminate, right? Because you're always going downwards um, and you have, so you have to stop by the time you hit a leaf because at that point there are no children. So none of the children could be bigger than n over two. So then we just have to show that the vertex it produces is always gonna be a centroid. Um, and so the way we do that is, if you look at all of its child subtrees, these are all um, obviously gonna be less than or equal to n over two because that's our stopping condition here, right? And then the one other case is we have to make sure that all of these vertices that are in sort of its parents subtree, if you remove it, we have to make sure there's at most n over two of those. Um, and it turns out if there were not n over two of those, then um, this size, if there were more than n over two of these, then that means that there are less than n over two vertices here, less than or equal to n over two vertices here, which means that we never would have recursed down to this vertex in the first place because it has a size uh, less than or equal to n over two. So because of that, we know that there's at most n over two above you as well. So this vertex is a centroid. All right, uh, questions on this? Okay. So the code for this is pretty straightforward. Um, this is kind of a standard DFS to fill your size array um, where you're basically DFSing down everything that's not the parent, right? Because the tree I is gonna hold everything, including the parent. So you just don't DFS the parent, add up all the sizes of the children, and put that in size I. Um, and then this is, uh, sort of the second DFS we're doing to actually find the centroid, where um, you start out at the root, and if any of the children have a size bigger than n over two, you recurse down to that child, otherwise you return the vertex you're currently on. It's basically just two DFSs here, essentially. All right. Oh, and one thing, um, there's a reason that we're put passing n in here as an argument instead of having it global, uh, but we'll get to that later. All right, questions on the code? Cool. All right, so now we're gonna get into our first example problem um, where you have a tree with 10 to the fifth vertices and you want to assign each vertex a capital letter such that if you pick any two vertices that have the same letter and you look at the path between them, um, that path has to pass through a vertex with a letter that's closer to the beginning of the alphabet, All right? So for example, if you pick this C and this C, the path between them passes through B, which occurs earlier in the alphabet, or like uh, this B and this B pass through A. Um, so how can we use the idea of a centroid to solve this problem? So one, one thing to think about is, so the letter you're gonna have the highest amount of restrictions on is A, 
right? Because if you have any two A's in the uh, tree and you draw a path between them, then um, you have to have something higher than A there, which doesn't exist. So that means we can only have one A in the graph. And sort of just think about how you can extend that to the other letters once you've dealt with all the A's. I guess it would be an increasing order because you could have two Bs like in this example because they can pass through that one A and you could have three Cs because they could pass through the two Bs theoretically. Yeah, so in, in this example, I think you can actually, you can have three Bs, right? Because we could make this one a B also. Um, yeah. But like how specifically would you pick the vertices to make like an A or a B or whatever? And the hint is centroids. So how could you sort of generalize that idea to assign every vertex a letter? Oh, I mean, it's just an idea, but you could start at the centroid and then kind of like, you could just do like a breadth first search almost and each level could be the next letter. Uh, so the first step of that work. So the first step is, yes, yeah, so you want A to be your centroid. Um, but the problem is, um, if you do like a BFS or a DFS after that, um, you could sort of need like up to 10 to the fifth letters, right? But the problem is we only have 26. Because um, like imagine if your graph was like uh, just a really long line of vertices. So if you pick, if you put A in the centroid, uh, a is like in the middle of that line. And now if you're like BFSing out doing like BCD, you're very quickly going to run out of letters. So yeah, so the placing, um, think about how you can sort of reduce the problem for placing B to the problem for placing A once you've already put A in. That's kind of, it might be a confusing way of phrasing it, but um, I guess one thing to think about is once you've decided on the place for A, um, what is the maximal number of Bs you can put down? And how would you want to do that? Rishi, sorry, can you explain the problem again? Like. Right. I, I don't yeah. know. It's kind of badly paying attention. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. You, you're assigning every vertex a letter. Um, if you take any two um, vertices on that have the same letter, right? So let's say we pick this D and this D. If you're looking at the path between them, uh, that has to contain a letter that's higher than D. So it has to contain either A, B, or C. Um, oh, okay. I see. Yeah, so that's why we can only have one A, because if you have two A's, then the path between them has to have something higher than A, but that doesn't exist. So you only get one A. So can, yeah. Can we only have degree A B's then? Because every B needs to either be directly next to a B or, well, actually, no, we can have more, right? Because a B can be next to a B, can it? So you, that's right. You can only have degree A B's. Because if you have more than degree A B's, then imagine removing A, then two of these Bs would be in the same component. And so the path between them would not contain the A. Okay. What um, a B has a B right next to it? Huh? Can a B oh, have no, a B yeah, right so, next to it? Yeah, if you, you can't have two adjacent letters that are the same. Because oh, the okay. path between them would be just those two. It wouldn't have anything higher on it. Okay, so I was thinking you put an A in the centroid. Then for each subgraph, you put a B in the centroid. Then for each of those subgraphs, you put a C, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, exactly. Um, and this leads us into sort of the main idea of the lecture, which is centroid decomposition. So basically, the idea is you're going to recursively find centroids of each subgraph until you've covered every single vertex. So we find the centroid of the whole tree. 
which is this vertex. And we mark this one with an A. And now we imagine sort of removing the A. And now we have three separate subproblems, right? Because you break it off into three components. And so we find the centroids of each of these components, which are these three. And I, I think there's multiple choices here, but we just pick arbitrarily. Um, and we mark each of these centroids with a B. And now we have even more components, uh, a lot of them of like size one. So we're gonna find the centroids of those, uh, mark those with C, then we mark the next ones with D and so on. Um, yeah, so the runtime of this, it seems like it might need to be N squared or something. Um, but notice that we're only gonna have to do log N levels of this. Um, because at each step, uh, by the definition of a centroid, the biggest component you can be left over with after removing the centroid is n over two. Um, so after you do log n steps, uh, you're, you have to have used basically every vertex, um, which also tells us that we can always do it using at most 26 letters because 26 is more than log n in that case. Um, and the runtime is also going to be n log n uh, because you can do sort of each level in a single O of n DFS, right? So even uh, let's say after you split off this A and you're looking at these three components, um, you can sort of find all of the yellow centroids in O of n time because it's just O of n time per component. And each component is like n over three here or whatever. So in total, it's still O of n. Um, yeah, so each level is still O of n. So in gen, in total, across all log n levels, you can do this in n. So I just have a question on this diagram. I don't know if it's just yeah. maybe the way you made it, but um, the yellow is B in this situation, right? Yeah, and yellow is B. C. So like yeah, that, that one where there's like red and it goes to like the top of red goes to green and then yellow, wouldn't that be A going through C into B? Uh, yes. Yeah, that's fine. Because remember, the only restriction is if you pick two things that are the same letter, so the same color, they have to go through oh, something the same higher. Letter. Okay, okay. Right, yeah. So like if you pick any two blue vertices here, or that's a bad example, any two yellow vertices, um, they have to go through the red one. Yeah. Because when you remove the red one, they're in separate components. All right. uh, any other questions on this idea or the runtime? Okay. All right, so uh, the code for this is gonna be not that much more code um, than we had before for just finding the centroid, um, but it's probably a little bit harder to understand. So we'll go over that pretty carefully. So we're basically just adding this one function, uh, decomp, which takes an uh, i, which is, uh, you can think of it as the root of the component that you wanna do the decomposition from, and l, which is the level that you're at right now. So like level one is a, level two is b, three is c. Um, and we're eventually gonna mark every vertex with a level using this LVL array. Um, so the reason we're using one, two, three here is because we're using zero to represent not a centroid yet for this vertex. Okay, so basically the idea is you would initially call uh, decomp of root and one because you're starting with level one. You're starting with placing the A essentially. Um, and you can pick the, pick the root, however. Um, and what we do is um, we call a get size, which fills the size array starting from I. Um, and this returns, this is kind of the confusing part. This returns the total number of vertices that we fill with this DFS, which in the first, the first time you run it is going to be N. So this is where we're sort of passing N into our centroid function, because notice that as we sort of split it up into smaller and smaller components, this size is no longer going to be N. This is just sort of a nice trick to get around that. So we're finding the centroid. Um, starting from our arbitrary root um, with uh, 
size many vertices in the component. So we find the centroid the way we did before, essentially. Then we want to mark that centroid with the current level. Um, and then you want to look at everything that's adjacent to it and basically um, start decomposing from all of those two under the condition that we haven't marked them as a centroid yet either. So for all of its neighbors that are not centroids yet, we're going to start another decomposition with level L plus one there. So if you look at like the red one here, we would pick some arbitrary root vertex, say this, we find the red centroid. Now what we do is we look at all of its neighbors. None of these guys have been marked as centroids yet. So we're going to start decomposing this component with this as the root, this component with this as the root, and this component with this as the root. Okay. Um, Questions on how this works? Yeah, could you run through it in the situation where there would be two centroids? Like two A's? Like two potential A's? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, so uh, it, if there is uh, like a tree that has two centroids, we're essentially just picking one arbitrarily. Like whichever one that algorithm we used before finds. So if it, we're, not, we're not ever going to use both. Yeah, I gotcha. Okay. Okay, and, and tree is a uh, directed graph then? Uh, it's undirected, well, um, then it... but we have the edges going in both directions. Like tree U holds V and tree V also holds U. Wait, but how would that work for get size then? Wouldn't the root not have to have its parent? Um, oh, so we're not, so, so the way we're doing parent is we're passing the parent in here and then, where's the code? Yeah, so we're passing the parent in as an argument. Um, oh. And then you're just checking that you're not DFSing down to the parent. So you don't have to store like a parent array outside, um, which is nice because you would have to change the parent array every time you did a new, every time you rerouted the tree, which we're gonna be doing a lot with this because every time you start a new decomposition, like now this is the root, and this is the root, and this is the root. So, yeah, we're just directly passing the parent in, which is, again, what this negative one does. Because if it's the root, we don't have a parent, so we don't have to worry about that. Okay, uh, any other questions? Wait, negative one? What do you mean negative one, sorry? Yeah, so we're passing negative one in here um, because basically in, in the other functions, we're checking to make sure that the vertices we're DFSing to aren't the parent. So this way, no matter what vertex we go to, it's not the parent. Um, but isn't the parent going to be different vertex vertices? Or, so, or oh, we, we specify negative one is always the parent? Well, a negative one is the parent of the root always. What about the parent of children? Right, so then um, oh, oh. Inside, inside here, uh, when you DFS from I to J, we pass I in as the parent. So that all happens like within this function, like figuring out. Oh, oh, I see, I see, I see. Yeah. So the negative one is basically just, uh, we never want this to be true. That's all that's doing. Okay. And again, this size that we get here is just the total number of vertices remaining in that component. Um, and we do have to make uh, one small change to those other two functions we're using, um, which is that we don't want to DFS to vertices that are already centroids. So we're just adding this and not level J here. Because once we've made something a centroid, we're essentially removing it from the graph. So we never want to DFS there in either of these functions. But other than that, these two stay the same as they were before. Any questions on the code? Okay. All right, so now um, 
we can sort of go another level further and start talking about the centroid tree, which is basically, we're gonna form a new tree using this decomposition we have, where the children of a vertex are the centroids on the next level um, after you remove it. So I guess sort of the best way to explain that is with a picture. So this graph here would turn into this centroid tree because when you remove this A, you split it into three components, um, which have the centroids that are these uh, yellow vertices, the B vertices. And then when you remove, say, this B vertex, which corresponds to this one, you're splitting it into four components, which are this vertex, this vertex, this vertex, and these vertices. And you'll notice that these, uh, it has four children representing the centroids of those four subtrees. So basically the depths in this tree are gonna be organized by what level they are. So like what letter they were in the problem we had before. Um, so the depth of this tree is gonna be only log n. And notice that um, not every edge in this tree is gonna to correspond to an edge in the other tree because like we have edges from this red vertex to all the yellow vertices. Um, but it's not connected to any of them in the original tree. So we can't really say anything nice about the edges in this tree versus the edges in the centroid tree. Um, but this is just the structure we're gonna use. All right, um, any questions on how we're sending this out? Okay. Okay, so uh, constructing this, given what we already have is uh, pretty straightforward. All we have to do is we're basically just modifying this line in the decomp function. Um, so every, every time we find the centroid, um, uh, we get all of the next level centroids, which are these. These are the L plus one level centroids that are formed by removing sent. And we're gonna set their parent in the centroid tree to be sent, which is the current centroid. So C power is just representing their parent in this tree. Um, so if you wanted to store uh, all of the children of a vertex, you could just sort of reverse all these edges. But uh, for what we're gonna do today, you, all you need is a parent, so we're not gonna worry about that. Okay. All right. And so one important fact about the centroid tree is, so if you look at every path in the original tree, it has to contain a unique vertex of minimal level. And this is kind of a similar idea to what we were talking about before with the letters, um, except this is a much stronger statement. So if you look at uh, any path, go back to the picture here. You look at any path between two vertices, um, it has to contain um, a, single vertex that's the highest level. So like if you look at this blue to this yellow, it contains A, which is the only one that's that level. And the way we can prove this is, let's say this wasn't true. Let's say like um, on this path, like these two green vertices were the two highest rank ones. Well then we know that the path between these two green vertices is a subset of the whole path, right? And by the previous problem, we know that there has to be one that's a higher rank than the green on this path. So then that's impossible. Um, so yeah, because of that, we know that every path between any two vertices has a unique vertex of highest level. Um, and we can use that. Uh, we also know that that vertex has to be the LCA of the endpoints of the path in the centroid tree. So this is LCA in the centroid tree, not in the original tree. Um, and we can show that because um, let's, I guess, look at two random vertices here. Let's say this blue one and this uh, bad example, this blue one and this green one. So the first time they were disconnected was when we removed this yellow vertex, um, which means the first time they were sort of split into two different subtrees was when we added this yellow vertex to centroid, which means that they're going to, um, their LCA 
in the center of tree uh, is going to be this yellow one because it sort of represents the first time they were split into separate components. And this is going to be the unique minimal level vertex on their path. All right, does that make sense? Because every time you put a vertex here, you're basically splitting all the remaining vertices into separate components. So the first time they split is gonna be their LCA. Okay, yeah, so we don't, like I said before, we don't know much about the edges and like a lot of the structure of the centroid tree, but we have this really nice fact that but on the path between any two vertices, their LCA must lie on, uh, their LCA in the centroid tree must lie on this path. Okay. Any questions about centroid tree? All right. So this sort of brings us into the main idea of centroid decomposition which is where you wanna sort of manipulate the centroid tree rather than the actual tree, um, which has some nice properties, right? Because the depth is only log n. So you have more freedom in what you can do to the tree. Uh, specifically, like what we're gonna do here is uh, iterate over all the ancestors of a node in log n time. Um, and then once we get this answer in the centroid tree, we want some way to sort of convert it back to the actual tree. Okay, so this is kind of an abstract idea. We're gonna go over it more specifically with a problem now. Um, so here's one problem you can do with central decomposition, which is you have a tree on n vertices. Um, all your vertices are initially blue and you have two types of queries um, where one is you paint some vertex red and the other query is print the minimum distance between some vertex and a red vertex and we want this to go down to log n time per query. So the way we're gonna do this is um, basically for every node, we want to maintain the minimum distance from that node to a red node that's in its subtree of the centroid tree. So this is confusing. So we'll do some examples here. So like, let's say you look at vertex four. Um, we want to look at only the red vertices in this subtree here, which happens to coincide with this subtree, but that might not always be the case. Um, so the minimal distance from four to a red vertex in this set, well, there's only one red vertex in this set, so that's going to be a distance of one. Um, notice that um, here for six, the answer is still negative one, as in like there is no red vertex in this subtree because its subtree is just itself. Even though in the other tree, it does have a red vertex in its subtree, we're only looking at its subtree in the center of the tree. And um, also notice we have this nice pattern here where like the distance is zero for seven, one for four and two for three but that's not always gonna be the case. It's not always gonna go up by one at every step because otherwise this would be a distance of one for three. But again, you can't make any assumptions about how um, distance works in the central tree versus the actual tree because nine and three are not adjacent in this tree. Um, so the answer would still be two. So I'll give you guys a second to sort of process this and ask questions. Um, but we're basically sort of going back and forth between these two trees to compute these values. So, um, could you go back one slide for a second? Yeah. I just want to read the problem we have. Right. Yeah, so your two queries are paint this vertex red and minimum distance between uh, this vertex and a red vertex. And we want to be able to do either one of those queries in log n, essentially. All 
right there. So, okay. Oh, I see. So the idea is to basically get the least common ancestor in the, uh, um, what do you call it, in the uh, centroid tree. Yeah. And then get the distance there. Yes. So the way we're actually going to do it is, so for queries where you're painting a node red, um, we want to know how do we uh, update these values, right? So initially, they're all going to be negative ones because there's no red vertices anywhere. Or right, maybe it's more helpful to think about it as uh, make them all infinity, and then we can just take them in. Um, so what we're notice that the only vertices we need to update, like let's say we paint eight red, the only vertices we need to update are the ones where eight is in their subtree, right? Because we're only looking at the subtree of the centroid tree. So the only ones we need to update are four and three. So because the depth of this tree is only log n. Um, we can do this update in log n time, right? So we want to update all its ancestors in the centroid tree. And so for, for each one of these ancestors, we want to set its distance to red to be the min of its current distance to red, which I guess all of them start out as infinity, um, and dist uv, where this is the LCA distance query we were talking about before, and its distance in the original tree. So for example, if we were painting uh, five red, so uh, we start out at five itself and um, we paint, oh, this, is, this is a bad example. Uh, let's say we're painting, well, yeah, let's say we're painting nine red. So we've already done that. Um, so first we look at distance from nine to nine in the original graph, which is zero. So we assign this a zero. Then we go up here and we assign this vertex a value of distance nine to three in the original graph, which is two. So that's how we would do that. Um, and you can sort of do a similar thing. Like if you're painting one red, you would assign this a value of zero and two, you would assign a value of one because these are one apart. And three, you would also assign a value of one because these are also one apart. So we're iterating up through the ancestors in the centroid tree, but we're updating them with the distances in the original tree. Does that make sense? What if in that problem they asked you for the distance from six, but we still had it as negative one because it wasn't updated from the centroid tree? Um. Oh, right. So you're saying if they asked you, what is the closest red node to six? Right? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, so yes, we haven't talked about how we're going to do the queries yet, um, but it turns out that that's not going to be an issue. Like we can, it turns out that this um, array we have here of these red values is all we need to answer the queries. Yeah. I was saying something a bit off. What I, what I, what I really meant to say was you just go up to the, uh, first ancestor that doesn't have a negative one, and then you just take that distance and add the distance to the ancestor. Um, that, that, that's the query. You're close. Um, so the thing is, with the queries, you can't only go to one ancestor. Uh, you want to go to all of your ancestors again in the tree. Oh, because some um, might have closer than, yeah. than that. So, um, yeah, so for the type 2 queries, we know that any path from uh, some vertex U to some red vertex R has to go through their LCA. And we know that, that LCA has to be an ancestor of U. Um, so what we can do is iterate over the ancestors of U. And um, if that vertex were the LCA, find out what the answer would be, uh, which would be distance from U to V in the original graph plus dist red V which you can think about as going from U to V in the original tree, and then going from V to a red vertex in the original tree. Um, and this is the reason that it doesn't matter if we have some negative ones there or if we have some infinities there, because we know that at least one of them will be not infinity, as long as there's at least one red node in the graph, uh, which we're guaranteed there will be. Um, so yeah, so if you go up to the root of the centroid tree, as long as you have one red vertex in the graph, you're going to have 
some distance red there. Um, so yeah. Does this make sense? Any questions on this? Okay. Um, and one sort of potential issue with this is uh, to think about, are we sort of double counting these paths? So let's say we're looking at vertex U um, and we go up to V and it finds the red node R. So the sort of issue here is uh, V is not the LCA of R and U. Um, so the path from U to V and V to R is not a valid path in the tree. Um, so does this mess up our approach? Um, and it turns out it doesn't because uh, if we ever have a situation like this, um, we're definitely gonna get a better answer when we have V here, when we have V as the actual LCA. Um, so since we're taking the min over all the ancestors of these values, um, we know that this value will eventually be thrown out. So it doesn't matter. So you have a better one here. Uh, but this kind of thing um, is sort of an important thing to think about in general for these center of decomposition problems. All right. Um, any questions on this problem in general? All right. So the code for this, once we have all of the uh, LCA set up and all the centroid decomposition set up, um, is not too bad. So um, to paint a vertex red, we have our vertex U here, and V is going to iterate over all the ancestors of U. Um, so we have... Uh, so the parent of the root of the centroid tree, we just have it equal to zero. Um, so that's why we can do this while V here. So while V is like a valid vertex in the centroid tree, um, we set the distance red of V to the min of its current value and the distance from U to V in the original tree. And then we move V up the centroid tree. And then we have a very similar structure here. Um, where we set ants equal to some big value here. And then we just take the min of all the distances for all the ancestors as you go up. All right. Okay. Now we're getting into actual problems. Uh, I think I'm just gonna go over this first problem um, because of time and it is more complicated than the previous one. Um, so it is a pretty hard problem. So you can sort of think of this problem as a more general version of uh, the previous problem, which is um, you want, you have again, two types of queries you need to do, where one is you color all the vertices at a distance less than or equal to D from vertex V and you color them all color C. And then the other query is print the color of vertex V. And we're going to end up with an n log squared n solution here. Um, and so the way we're going to do this is kind of a slightly more complicated version of what we just did in the previous one. Uh, but it, it's using the same idea of you iterate uh, past all the ancestors for all the queries. OK. Uh, first of all, is everyone clear on the problem? There's a, a lot of letters here, but. Yeah. You're basically coloring some range of the tree a certain color and painting over any colors that were already there. OK. So basically, what we want to do here is in the previous one, we had um, we were storing a single integer for every vertex that stored the minimum distance to a red. So here, instead of an integer, we're going to store a vector um, of basically all the updates. So it's not really all the updates that have covered this vertex. It's um, you sort of think about it in terms of the last problem, where we weren't storing minimum distance to all red vertices. It was only to those in its subtree. So what this what this list is is it's a list of all the updates that um, color this vertex where the start of that update 
um, like the vertex V of that update is in its subtree of the centroid tree. So again, we're only concerned with the updates in its subtree of the centroid tree here. And so the way we want to store this vector is we want them to be descending by distance. Um, and we also want to keep it sorted ascending by time. And sort of the easy way we can do this is um, if you get an update that has a higher distance value at a later time, we can just throw out the value with the smaller distance at the previous time, right? Because we're going to completely paint over that one with this update. Um, yeah, and initially, uh, because everything is color zero, we can put one element in every list uh, with a distance of infinity, a color of zero, and a time of, say, negative one. So like a vector could look something like this, where like your distances are infinity, three, one. Notice that those are strictly decreasing. And your times are negative one, zero, three. Notice those are strictly increasing. And then in the middle, we have these colors, which don't have to obey any ordering, because they're just sort of markers. All right, so does, we haven't talked about how we're going to like maintain this at all. Um, but does sort of the general structure of what we're storing make sense? It's a kind of the analog of uh, closest red vertex in your subtree. This is like all of the updates in your subtree of the centroid tree that affect you. Okay. So for update queries, um, again, we're only going to update the ancestors of you because again, we're only concerned with things where it's in the subtree. Um, and so for each query where we have a vertex U, a distance D, and a color C, and at some time T, we're going to update every ancestor by um, basically computing if we go from U to V, how far can we go after that, right? So since we can only go D in total, um, once you go from U to V, you can go up to K more, where K is D minus distance from U to V in the original graph. So yeah, so we're basically coloring everything that's within a distance of D. Um, and if it's within a distance, sort of if um, V is the LCA, on the path between you and some other vertex. Um, we can reach that other vertex as long as it's within K of V. Because you have to go through, you have to go to U, you go to U through V, and then to your other vertex, W or whatever. And that's not going to work unless W is within K of this vertex. All right? And so if K is less than zero, then we can't even reach this ancestor. Uh, starting from U. So we can just sort of throw out that update. Um, but otherwise, we can sort of add it to the vector. And we can maintain this property we had very nicely um, by basically remove the last element from the list while its distance is less than or equal to K. Because that's what we were talking about before. If you have a smaller distance at a previous time, you're going to get completely painted over. So we ignore that. Um, and then once we've finished that, um, we add basically KCT to the end of your list. So a distance of K, a color of C, and a time of T. So notice that we don't have to like actually sort any of these uh, vectors. It, it, by maintaining, uh, by doing this every time we do an insert, that'll maintain the sorted direction for both the distance and the time. Um, any questions on this? This is probably the most complicated thing we're going to go over today. Yeah, the, probably the most helpful way of thinking about it is sort of uh, how it relates to the previous one. Because um, we're sort of doing the same thing, but the updates are more complicated. And then the queries are going to be similar. 
So we're iterating over the ancestors of you again. And now we want to binary search to find um, the smallest distance update that can reach you from V. So we want the smallest update that has a distance of at least dist UV, right? Because that's going to be the um, latest update in terms of time um, that can reach you from V. So that's going to be the final color of you. Um, however, notice, again, we have to iterate over all the ancestors. Um, so for each ancestor, we're going to get like a color and a time pair. Um, but we want to look at the latest time. Uh, yeah, th this should be the latest update across all login ancestors and return its color. Because each one might give you a different update that paints over you. Uh, but the latest one is going to be the one, the color that you are, essentially. Right. Questions on this problem? It's pretty confusing, but. All right. OK. So. Now we're gonna get into the last problem. And nice thing about this problem is it's not using any of the centroid decomposition uh, stuff. So it's none of the like centroid tree or anything like that in this problem. Uh, this is sort of going back to like purely what is a centroid and what can you do with it? But it's still a very interesting problem. Um, we're gonna talk about it. And if you guys were here for our HLD lecture last semester, uh, this is the exact same problem because this has both an HLD solution and a centroid solution. Uh, I think this solution is probably easier than the HLD solution. So yeah, basically in this problem, it's an interactive problem where you have this tree and you're given all the edges in the tree and you want to find um, which node is this hidden node X. Um, so your tree is rooted at vertex one and you can ask two types of queries, uh, where one is distance between u and x for some vertex u, and the other one is the uh, second vertex on the path from u to x. And this is only a valid query if u is an ancestor of x. So like if we ask s1, um, that'll give us this vertex, because that's the second vertex on the path to x starting at 1. But if we look at this vertex and we ask S of this vertex, you'll immediately get WA because this is not an ancestor of X. And uh, basically we want to find X in at most two log N queries. Yeah, you have a couple extra queries there because log N is like strictly less than 18, but yeah. Does anyone have any general ideas for how to do this? Um, I was thinking you take the centroid, you get the next one on the path, and then you take the centroid of that tree, and then you get the next one on the path or something like that. That's but, close. That's like half of it. But then I'm not sure what distance, what's the point of distance? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, right. So initially what we're going to do is we're going to query D1 to get the depth of X. And then we're going to do what uh, Andrew was talking about, where uh, we want to sort of cut the number of nodes that could be x in half repeatedly, using at most two queries. Um, so if we let c be the centroid of the potential x nodes, so initially c is just the centroid of the tree, um, then we want to handle a few cases. right? So if we get the centroid is here, right? the centroid of this tree would be this vertex. Um, so in this case, we can query SC and get X. But let's say X was over here. Uh, now we can't query SC um, because C is not an ancestor of X. So how would we handle the case? First, how would we detect the case where X is not in the subtree of C? And then how would we handle it and still be able to cut off half the vertices? What happens if you query the distance from x to x? Uh, it returns zero. 
I mean, sorry, if you return, if you give the second vertex on the path from X to X, what would it give? Um, I think that would be invalid. I think I would WA. Oh, so you're not allowed to do that. Yeah. So that's what that's what that's the point of distance. You basically just say, okay, the first path is going to be in this subtree, and then I just query distance to see if it's X. And then um, and then again I just query again on the centroid of the subtree. So I just like keep going to a smaller and smaller no, subtree. No, but the issue is what if the cent what if X is not in the subtree of the centroid? Like what if so C is here, right? What if X is over here? Then we can't do um, Well the the first Vertex is going to be S1, and we can figure out the uh, parent well, centroid well, of S1. Looks like X was here then. Well, I mean, again, we can figure out the parent centroid of S1, so it would be in, in that like subtree that's in that direction. I don't know if figuring Wait, out the parent. Can you repeat that? Like, if, if we go to S1, yeah. and we, like, like it tells us it's S1, then we know what, like, which, which uh, centroid, like, subtree. It isn't. So you mean like if you remove the centroid, which component it would be in? Yeah. Um, and then like you keep reducing the size uh, of the tree that you're searching for. Because no, uh, like if this was the centroid, you, uh, if X was here, like if you get S1 here uh, and your centroid's here, uh, X could be either in this component, this component, this component, or this component here when you remove the centroid. But, uh, uh, would it, wouldn't it have to be in the upper component because S, S1 is in the upper component? Like the shortest path wouldn't go through the bottom components. Right, but... Um, like if X is down here, this would be S1 because it has to go, this is the, the next one on the path. Well, it if X, is, here. It, well, it, if X is down here. there, the distance, I mean, the the path from the centroid to X would be X, it wouldn't be S1. And then you would just take this, this subtree that contains X. Wait. Oh, you're saying do S of the centroid and not S of one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. S, S, oh. S is the centroid. Right. So the problem with that is, let's say X is like here and C is here. You you would think you'd get S, uh, C as this, but you don't because, uh, again, we have this restriction that you has to be an ancestor of X. Oh. In, in that situation, though, couldn't we then, like, find the centroid of the next, of that tree above it and then use that centroid and then do the exact same thing? Right. And, yeah. So the thing is, we have to sort of detect when that case is happening. So how do we know if um, basically X is in the subtree of C uh, or if it's above the subtree of C? And again, we have two queries per thing. So we have one more query we can use. Oh, we, we use distance to get the... Say. Yes. Oh, yeah. I what? see, like, if it returns WA at that centroid, it's going to be above it. And if it doesn't, then it's going to be below it. You know, so for um, WA is like wrong answer. Like your, your code immediately fails. Um, so it, if you ever do, if you ever give that query, your, your code fails. So you're not allowed to do that. Oh, gotcha. Um, but yeah, uh, someone was saying something about distance and depth. So remember, we um, we queried D1 to get depth of X. And we also want to query DC. So how can we use depth of X and DC to detect if X is in the subtree of C? Oh, just simple subtraction, I guess. Yeah, but exactly. Um, so, OK, if DC is 0, then we have C equals X, right? Because it's the same vertex. Um, otherwise, if depth of C, so this depth, plus DC, plus this, equals the depth of X, then C has to be an ancestor of X. Um, otherwise, it's not an ancestor of X. But uh, in this case, where it is an ancestor of X, 
then we're going to use the s query. We're going to query sc, and we're going to recurse on the subtree of v. Um, and oh, whoops, because c is a centroid, um, the size of the subtree is going to be at most n over two. Um, so we've uh, we've cut it in half with two queries, like we wanted to. And then the other case, which you guys were talking about, is where x is not in the subtree of c. It's so like x is over here and c is here. In this case, we can just remove the subtree of c then. Um, and because c is a centroid, again, we have at most n over two remaining vertices. So we've cut the search space in half again with one query. So yeah, this is then going to solve the problem in at most two log n queries. So we will solve it in 36 with no problem. All right, uh, questions on this problem? All right, cool. So yeah, thank you guys for coming. Um, on this slide, I have links to all the problems we did here, plus uh, Centroid Decomp template. Um, and these slides are in the info channel on Discord if you guys want to check them out. So yeah, uh, thank you for coming.